Okay, so hello everybody and welcome to this uh, second uh, recap uh, webinar. Today's webinar is entitled The Narrow Corridor, Our Nation's Struggle for Liberty. Our speaker is uh, Professor Daron Asemoglu from uh, MIT. Before introducing Daron, let me say a few words about today's uh, webinar. Daron today is going to remind us that liberty is not granted. Rather, liberty is achieved in that narrow corridor where the civil society actively balances the state. Along this narrow corridor, the civil society monitors its powers, disagrees with it, and contests it sometimes, and sometimes cooperates with it as well. This corridor is narrow, and let me add, also fragile. In a passage of the Republic, Plato, through Socrates, teaches us about the different political system, how they can change over time and slowly transform into another. There are also a shocking statement about the fragility of democracy is made on how democracy can be subverted into tyranny by opportunistic demagogues through manipulative leading of the people. The question here is whether Plato is also providing a salutary warning concerning the current risk associated with the growing populist movements in various countries and the rise of unscrupulous manipulative leaders. Moreover, how healthy are our democracies in Western countries? I would like to show you uh, a plot. This plot is the Democracy Index, which is a uh, uh, published by the weekly newspaper, The Economy. This index is uh, centrally concerned with political institution and freedom and uh, intended to measure the state of uh, democracy. You can clearly, clearly see a long lasting decline in this index, uh, starting uh, from the financial crisis for both Western European countries and uh, North America as well. Well, let me conclude that it appears that there is some work ahead for our civil society to invert this persistent downward trend in the quality of our democracies. Without further ado, please let me now introduce our uh, speaker. Baron Asemoglu is a, an institute professor at MIT and an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, American Philosophical Society, the British Academy of Sciences, the Turkish Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, the European Economic Association, and the Society of Labor Economists. He's also a member of the Group of 30. He is the author of five books, including New York Times bestseller, Why Nations Fail, Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, joined with James A. Robinson, Introduction to Modern Economic Growth, and the narrow corridor, state, society, and the fate of liberty, joined with James A. Robinson. His academic work covers a wide range of areas, including political economy, economic development, economic growth, technological change, inequality, labor economics, and economics of networks. Daron Asemoglu has received the inaugural T.W. Schultz Prize from the University of Chicago in 2004, and the inaugural Sherwin Rosen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Labor Economics in 2004, Distinguished Science Award from the Turkish Sciences Association in 2006, the John von Neumann Award Race College Budapest in 2007, the Carnegie Fellowship in 2017, the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize in 2018, the Global Economic Prize in 2019, and the CME Mathematical and Statistical Research Institute Prize in 2021. He was awarded the John Bates Clark Medal in 2005, the Irwin Klein Nemers Prize in 2012, and the 2016 BBVA Frontiers of Knowledge Award. He holds honorary doctorates from the University of Utrecht, the Bosphorus University, University of Athens, Wilkins University, University of Bath, Ecole Normale Supérieure, Saclay Paris, and the London Business School. Many thanks uh, for being with us today, Darren. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Claudio. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to join all of you. And thank you to 
uh, the members of the audience for making time from your busy day to join us. I look forward to the conversation. I will talk for, uh, I'll try to talk to less than 40 minutes so that we have uh, 15 minutes or so for uh, Q&A. I look forward to hearing your comments and perspectives. So I'm going to talk about building better institutions for our future based on the framework of the book, The Narrow Corridor, which I co-wrote with James Robinson, and it was published in 2019. Of course, the world has changed quite a bit before since 2019, uh, but I think the framework is still useful and I'll try to sort of uh, broaden the discussion to take on some of the challenges that we face. So the question I think for many people is how to move away from something that these castas uh, paintings from colonial Latin America signify a society that is either formally or informally divided into unequal castes, people with huge amount of social, political and economic power against those that have much less, much less respect, much less social status and much less opportunity. How to move away from this, but to what? Well, I think my argument in this book and in past work is that really these two components of what we need to move into are complementary, justice and participation. So here participation is shown as a democratic process voting, but I'll come back to, uh, if we have time, broader ways of thinking about participation. But what is justice? Well, I think there is a lot of disagreement on what justice really constitutes. So we have to start with something. And I think uh, the best place from our perspective is philosopher Philip Pettit's views of dominance. So Pettit defines dominance as to live at the mercy of another, having to live in a manner that leaves you vulnerable to some ill that the other is in a position to arbitrarily impose, subject to the arbitrary sway, being subject to the potentially capricious will or the potentially idiosyncratic judgment of another. Where another here, you know, in Pettit is, is another person, but, you know, we can think of institutions, groups, or social norms playing this role of creating a capricious will or idiosyncratic judgment against you that will be completely debilitating, empowering. So we therefore think that a broad notion of liberty, not in the sense of the negative freedom that uh, you know, libertarian or uh, classic liberal philosophers have defined, but a broader notion of liberty as lack of dominance is the basic building block of justice. So it requires definitely lack of violence or threat of violence, but it also requires broadly distributed opportunities and the breakdown of all caste systems, rigid social hierarchies, because if you have, you know, a caste-like system, obviously you're going to be at the arbitrary sway of another, another group, another social norm, but also in order to really break away from something like this, you really need opportunities. So it's, it's, it's not enough to be said, okay, fine, nobody is going to interfere with your choices, but you have no option but work at sub-minimum wage in the most uh, demeaning jobs, that's not going to move away from dominance, at least as we are defining it or as Philip Pettit is defining it. So if you view it this way, then there are several challenges against justice and liberty. The first is hierarchy and inequality. So economic hierarchy and economic inequality are going to be definitely barriers on this, because if you have huge amounts of inequality, then the people at the top are going to gain much greater power, social power, and potentially dominance, and the people at the bottom are not going to have the tools to develop the type of autonomy that would be necessary for breaking away from that violence. So using the World Income Database, for example, if you look at the share of uh, the top 1% owns, in many places, such as Russia, uh, South Asia, parts of Latin America, it's above 20%, as high as 40%. So obviously that's an incredibly high level of inequality. And once you are at such a level, it really defines uh, sort of a very rigid hierarchy. But in fact, social hierarchy 
may go even beyond this. So if you look at one country, for instance, in Latin America, Chile, uh, that has made a lot of progress over the last 30 years in terms of reducing observable inequality, for example, uh, the gap between rich and poor or the Gini index. But there's still a lot of discontent. And when you dig deeper, you see that part of the reason is because there is a deeper social hierarchy that goes beyond economic inequality. So there's an inequality of social status and that defines who has access to good jobs, who has access to political power, who has access to good education, to voice, even access to protection against the virus. The so one way of seeing that, uh, and, and I think one of the motivations for many of the movements that erupted in Chile over the last few years and brought a uh, fairly left-wing president to power over the last month is uh, you know, how political power was distributed. So if you look at the uh, cabinet of uh, President Sebastian Piñera in 2010, you know, 86% of the cabinet members came from private schools and 86% of the business elite around the same time came from private schools, even though private schools make up less than 1% of the school uh, uh, population. So that again shows a very skewed distribution of hierarchy status and power. But it goes beyond that. It's not only a problem at the top, it's also a problem at the bottom. So this is a picture of what is called a manual scavenger in India. Uh, these are people who work doing some of the worst jobs, for example, uh, cleaning latrines uh, or, uh, or, or animal carcasses or human excrement. And they work at below minimum wages. There's constant violence, threat of violence and demeaning behavior towards them. There may be several million, million manual scavengers, even though the government has repeatedly uh, sort of committed to reducing their numbers. And if you look at their compositions, almost all of them come from lower caste people, the Dalits, the untouchables. So you see there uh, hundreds of millions of people who are at the lower castes that are pushed into jobs like not all of them as bad as manual scavengers, but lower, much lower social status jobs. So it is a problem at the top as well as a problem at the bottom. In our book, we also identify this as a problem of cage of norms. Many of the times, this is just like the business elite in Chile. It's not because of things that are written in the law or the constitution, but it is because of the norms that prevail. And sometimes norms create a cage around some people, hundreds of millions of people in India, that completely robs them of any autonomy, of any freedom, and any sense of justice. So therefore, you really to deal with this problem of hierarchy of inequality, that is at the root of building better institutions, you really have to break the cage of norms as well as find better ways of dealing with economic inequality. But actually, in many ways, things are getting worse. So if you look at global inequality trends, inequality is increasing in the developing world, but even more surprisingly, it's increasing in the developed world as well. So here, it's an extreme case in some respects, but not so atypical of what's going on in the Western world. I'm giving you here, the data on weekly earnings of men with different education levels in the United States. So from the 1950s onwards here, I'm showing it from 1960, but it's the same is true from 1950 onwards. From 1950 onwards to about the mid 70s, you had different education groups enjoy more or less the same level of real wage growth. So here you see people with postgraduate degrees, people with some college, high school graduates, high school dropouts, college degrees, they're all growing around 2% a year in real terms. But around 1980 onwards, you see a very, very different picture. Those with a postgraduate degree continue to grow, but lower education, but even people with two year degrees, community colleges, associate degrees are experiencing very sharp declines in their real wages. So it's not just that inequality is increasing, some people are benefiting more than others, but economic growth for what it's worth is actually impoverishing significant fraction, actually more than half of the US population, according or half of the more US male population have had their real earnings come down in some uh, notional sense. 
This is not confined to the United States, as I've pointed out. At the root of this is the elimination due to automation, to some degree also globalization, but uh, largely automation uh, of many middle class jobs on factory floors, blue color jobs, assembly, etc. Uh, painting, welding, but also office jobs, back offices, uh, 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 secretarial job, administrative jobs, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and when you look at that trend across OECD countries, for example, you see that there are very strong parallels. So in this instance, if you look at the middle paying third of all occupations, which are the ones that are responsible for that decline in real earnings in the United States that I just showed you, well, the same pattern is visible across all of the countries for which we have data. Uh, those jobs are disappearing throughout. Now, challenge two is that the other pillar of better institutions as I've defined them has also made very significant uh, 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 retreat. In 1989, as the Berlin Wall came down, there was general euphoria, and some people like Francis Fukuyama predicted the end of history with the Anabashid victory of political and economic liberalism. And in fact, from the mid 1980s to mid 2000s, for about two decades, there was very rapid expansion of democracies and strengthening of the institutions of existing democratic countries. But since 2006, that trend has reversed, and this is completely independent of COVID. So it's all of this was going on very rapidly before COVID, and it has just uh, uh, acquired further acceleration after COVID. So every year since 2006, there have been more countries that have abandoned democracies than entered into democracies, and there have been more countries whose democratic institutions have weakened rather than have improved. And of course, there are, emblematic cases. China, I think, is the most visible one. Many Westerners, including several presidents, have claimed that all you had to do was to trade freely with China and let American inventions such as McDonald's and jeans go to China, and that would bring a process of democratization. But today, much more emblematic of China are these face recognition, facial recognition cameras in Tiananmen Square, in case anybody thinks of doing any type of protest. And China has also become a leader in AI, but often applied to data collection about individuals as uh, epitomized by the social credit score that has been implemented over the last three years at the local level and will be rolled out at the national level at some point where every behavior is being logged into a big data set so that you can uh, be rewarded, for example, with jobs, uh, apartments, uh, travel permits, and so on, in case you are behaving in a way that's consistent with the Communist Party's uh, view of how society should be organized and will be punished otherwise. And of course, new challenges related to the coronavirus. Uh, many people see it as threatening democracy directly or indirectly, perhaps continuing the trends that I showed already, and big questions about globalization as well. But let me not get go into those because I want to sort of push ahead and talk about the conceptual framework that I want to propose for thinking about these issues and talk about some of the implications. But before I uh, present the, as, as a way of presenting the conceptual framework, I want to uh, point out that these issues are not new. Uh, Claudio very uh, helpfully quoted Plato. We could also talk about Aristotle and several uh, early uh, Indian uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Chinese philosophers as well. But in fact, they go back the first evidence of written thought, the Sumerian tablets from 4,200 years ago from the city of Uruk actually talk about exactly these issues. They tell the epic of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, who created a rich and secure and powerful city on the banks of Euphrates. See how its ramparts gleam like copper in the sun. Climb the stone staircase, approach the Anna temple, sacred to the Ishtar, a temple that no king has equaled in size or beauty. Uh, so the tablets start praising the king of Uruk because he has created the conditions for flourishing economically and also various other social improvements. But soon a fly appears in the ointment. 
it's the hitch of despotism and in a way that I'm going to define despotism in a second, but you can already get the feeling from this quotation. They immediately talk about who is like Gilgamesh, what other king has inspired such awe? Who else can say I alone rule supreme among mankind? The city in his possession, so is his possession. He struts through it, it's arrogant, his head raised high, trampling its citizens like a wild bull. He is king, he does whatever he wants, takes the son from his father, crushes him, takes the girl from her mother and uses her. No, one's, no one dares to oppose him. So you see in this entire text, and especially in the parts that I emphasize in red, this is the definition of dominance. So from the beginning, as soon as humans have started writing, they are writing about how governments, when well run, can help us with many of the things that we want, but immediately we can degenerate into despotism as a way of creating the dominance that humans have always feared. The tablets are very interesting because they not only identify the problem, but they also suggest a solution. In fact, it's the first checks and balances solution that is known. Citizens cry out to the heaven, to the, uh, the god of the sky, Anu, to stop this despotism. And Anu comes up with a solution, create a double for Gilgamesh, his second self, a man who equals his strength and courage, a man who equals his stormy heart. So what's going to happen is that this new uh, double, Enkidu, is going to balance each other. That's exactly the checks, checks and balances. Sounds great. And many important Western thinkers from Montesquieu to Madison would have agreed, except that if you read on, you see that actually it doesn't work out so well. Enkidu fights Gilgamesh. It's a big fight, so it's not good for the city. So all that fighting is not that great. But later on, they gang up together and they go into their uh, adventures uh, as a team. So what is there to stop those kinds of fighting between the different strong men, if you create strong men or strong institutions against each other, or those things themselves being degenerated? Well, that's the heart of our book. We think that what you need is popular mobilization. So the, uh, uh, the epic of Gilgamesh gets many things right, but doesn't get the right solution to the problem that it identifies. So in the Gilgamesh epic, or in Madison's view of how US constitution should function, this was missing. Individuals getting organized, pouring into the streets, participating in politics. Actually, many of the thinkers who came from the elite position like Madison or George Washington were not so keen on democracy, even via the booth because they thought that could degenerate the better plans that elites could have formed. So that's actually quite critical. In fact, those ideas go back quite a long time, even before Plato also, but to ancient Greece this time, this is uh, the ancient Athenians way of getting popular mobilization going. It was one of the many innovations they came up with while they were building state institutions of the sort that the Gilgamesh epic would have approved, but at the same time, also building different tools for dealing with despotism than the checks and balances of the god of sky Anu. So one of them was the many innovations that Cleisthenes introduced around uh, sixth century BC. And, uh, and, and, and one of the interesting one is the ostracism law. It comes from the word ostracon, which means a broken piece of pottery shard. And according to the ostracism law, every year the Athenian assembly, which was itself elected and very democratic, would decide whether there should be a public ostracism. And if there were going to be a public ostracism, every Athenian citizen, unfortunately not women, and unfortunately not many of the slaves that existed in Athens, but every citizen would write the name of a person on a piece of pottery, ostracon, hence the name ostracism, and whosoever name was written most would be banished from the city, exiled for 10 years. So this was a way of making sure that nobody got too big for their boots. And in this case, this, the name here is Themistocles, probably the greatest hero that Athens had, saved Athens against the Persians and then identified correctly the threat from Sparta and prepared Athens for a potential war against Sparta. 
risk. But at some point, Athenians thought he was becoming too dominant and they exiled him for 10 years from the city. So this is really the key to us. The right way to think of building better institutions is via the shackling of the Leviathan, the state as in Hobbes' uh, view uh, of how society should be organized. And that shackling cannot be done just by constitutions. Constitutions are of course useful, but not just by constitutions. It has to be done by citizen society, non-elites themselves being organized. Once the Leviathan is shackled, then you get a very different type of politics, very different type of social relations, and perhaps very different types of social dynamics. So that we try to capture with this key figure, which summarizes our conceptual point, you know, simplifies it in some ways, but I think it's a fairly faithful summary of the ideas we want to communicate. We reduce everything to two, power of the state and the elites that control the state or have disproportionate effect on the state and power of society. So non-elites, regular people, how they are organized, how they can develop norms, traditions, political tools, political organization, voice, and so on. And we think that over the last, <clears throat> the types of social structures and dynamics that have emerged over the last, you know, 20,000 years can be approximated by thinking of how societies fall, how different polities fall in terms of the power of the state and power of society somewhere in this figure. So the sort of the ideal type that Thomas Hobbes painted in his uh, epochal book, which still influences most of social science as deeply as any other book, is a despotic Leviathan. The state is very strong. The elite that controls the state, the ruler is very strong. And society has to prostrate against the state. That leads to the despotic Leviathan and to a very different types of dynamics. Once the states are very strong, they start undercutting the society's strength. Many Pre-modern societies, on the other hand, are at the other polar extreme. Uh, some of the surviving hunter-gatherer societies illustrate this, such as the Tiv in central Nigeria. They have very strong traditions that are anti-hierarchical, anti-inequality, anti-rulers. They have chiefs, but the chiefs are extremely weak. They are often deposed. People don't have to obey them. And there are many mores and traditions that limit how much an individual can uh, develop uh, power over others. And those are completely central to the way that their society is organized. So those are ways of solving the collective action problem and limiting hierarchy. But once you limit hierarchy, then the power of the state cannot increase. And hence, you get very different dynamics here. The name of the book comes from this region in between. It looks like a corridor, and it's a narrow area between these two black lines. And that generates something quite different from the despotic Leviathan or the weak or absent state that I've shown you so far. Instead, it is characterized by a condition of balance between state and elites on the one hand and society and non-elites on the other hand. And once that balance is reached, you get the preconditions for liberty, justice, and democratic bottom-up participation. The conditions, because just getting the balance is not enough. It's a process. And you can see that in two ways in this figure, two complementary ways. One of them is that you can be in the corridor, but here, where both the power of the state is very weak and the power of the society's ability to participate are very weak. Neither of this is going to be very good for the things that you're talking about, like justice. Where are you going to get public good provision? Where are you going to get dispute resolution that's fair, impartial, and respected and trusted? For that, you really need to build the power of the state. So it's a process that you need to do. And in fact, you see that that process takes place in a very intriguing way in the corridor. Outside of the corridor, you see these dynamics where <clears throat> ultimately the state is getting stronger somehow, but society is getting weak. And here, the only way that you actually maintain some degree of autonomy is by weakening the state. That's the key of the many of the surviving hunter-gatherer societies and what we know from archaeological record from long surviving uh, pre-modern societies that achieve this is that they kill hierarchy via many, many of the tools. 
But inside the corridor, you have something very different. Both the power of the state and power of the society are increasing at the same time. Hence, these arrows that show these trajectories are upward sloping. <coughs> That's the basis of the claim that I made, that building liberty, building justice, building bottom-up democratic participation is a process. And I want to emphasize again, going back to a point that I made earlier, truly democratic participation is just one way in which power of society can exhibit itself. It's an important way, and I think it's a critical way for being in the corridor because it's an institutionalization of the power of society. But it's only one way. The TIV and many of the other societies like that did not have elections, but they had other more informal ways of solving the collective action problem. And even in democratic societies, you need things like this, where it's not just voting, but people go on the streets, they protest, they have their voices heard. So it's a multidimensional thing for society to have its voice heard. <coughs> so, but there's another important implication from that figure. It shows that contested power is greater power. There's a very common view in political science and in popular writing in New York Times and Wall Street Journal, that you really need very strong state institutions, state capacity. And the way you acquire that is by making these state institutions strong and autonomous. Uh, based on that, many social scientists like Fukuyama, Huntington, and many others recommended that the US should go and try to establish the dominance of the state and the group that controls the state in places like Afghanistan, Somalia, or Iraq with disastrous consequences. And in fact, it's not that those ideas were badly applied. The problem was that those ideas are problematic. In fact, it is contested power that's greater power. When you make the state and the groups that control the state very strong, you're going to get the despotic Leviathan. Despotic Leviathan is going to acquire some degree of capacity, but much less capacity that a contested power can get. And the reason for that is because you have what we call a red queen dynamic here. The state gets stronger and society has to get stronger to counterbalance it, and that creates some virtuous dynamics. And moreover, it is only in this corridor that people trust the state because they think they can control the state. It's not always true. Sometimes they're wrong, but at least there is some basis for believing that you can trust. Therefore, you share information. You work with the state. You let the state institutions penetrate society. And those are what we call the red queen dynamics <coughs> or strong state because people consent to consensually strong state. But none of this should be read to imply that there is a very strong process of virtuous cycles that will make sure that you always end up with liberty, creating more liberty. Liberty is by construction fragile in the corridor because the corridor is narrow. Difficulty of maintaining the balance between elites and non-elites is present, and it's always subject to continuous threats. Why? Because once I am a business owner, especially a successful one, why don't I want to increase my power? And that means my social power, my social status, my economic power, my political power. So there is this always continuous endogenously generated threats. But even worse, there are also new technologies that will frequently come and start disrupting the balance. And I'll talk about one of them in a second. But one of them I already showed you. Once you have facial recognition cameras and huge amounts of data in the hands of the state, such as the Chinese state, that is going to be a shock to the system. But in order to talk about these, while also illustrating how to use the framework, let me go to a historical question. And then I'll develop one important implication of the framework in the context of that historical question. Where do strong high capacity states come from? Actually, the literature has proposed various structural factors as explanations. The nature of technology, going back to Marx, war and threat of war, some kinds of geographies, some kinds of crops, and so on and so forth. But if you actually look at it, the history, the literature is mired in debates because for every proposed structural factor, there are many counterexamples. The most famous one today, nowadays, is the ideas of Charles Tilley, that it was the nature and the threat of war that caused it. 
in the famous sentence of Charles Tilly, states made war and war made the state. Does that make sense? To what extent does it make sense? And why are there counterexamples? And how, do, how does our framework speak to it? Well, it's actually a very good way of understanding it. Let's take exactly the same figure and imagine just like Tilly does that there is a military revolution, the technology for military power changes around the 16th century, starting 15th century perhaps, uh, and perhaps a little earlier. And that forces the states to get stronger. They have to raise more revenues. They have to form bigger supply chains and requisition lines. They have to take over uh, more land and they have to form bureaucratic structures in order to organize these things. But you can see that exactly what Tilly says could happen. You can take a place like Switzerland, where there were many cantons that were very anti-authority, very decentralized, not working together, actually a lot of lawlessness. And then the threat of war, in this case against the Holy Roman Empire, forces them to band together and create a dynamic that takes you inside the corridor and then things develop inside the corridor. Swiss history actually is a very good illustration of this. But exactly the opposite can happen. You can take a place like Prussia, Third Year War and King William, Frederick William I, and they build a much stronger army, a much stronger state, disband the parliament as they did, and Prussia goes out of the corridor. Or you can have other dynamics like Montenegro that was engaged in many wars against the Ottoman Empire, but never state institutions formed and took root until the 20th century. And this is very relevant in my opinion because it emphasizes the conditional nature of what economists call comparative statics. So the political science literature, I think was mired in debate and lack of progress in my opinion, because they thought that structural factors should always have the same impact. But in fact, what this framework says is that the same structural factor could have the opposite impact. It can take you into, in, into the corridor or it can take you outside of the corridor. So that's what I mean by conditional comparative statics. But it has, more relevant implications for today because it implies that technology does not have predetermined effects on freedom, inequality, or organization of society. The internet can bring freedom as people first thought, or it can bring censorship as we have seen in, in Russia, Iran, and most vividly in China. New AI-based technologies and digital technologies can bring automation or labor-friendly technologies, very different implications with inequality. They can be used for empowering workers or they can be used for monitoring workers. So exactly like in here, how you use the technology and where you start in terms of the power balance in society, power of the elites, power of big corporations, power of researchers, power of decentralized group, power of unions, those are going to be critical. I think those are gonna be the defining question of the 21st century, especially with AI, its implications on society, politics and economy. And I think this kind of framework is going to be relevant. I don't have time to talk about it in great detail, but the framework also implies a different perspective on development policy. Development policy is often in the hands of uh, the World Bank or other organizations try to come up with systematic ways of thinking about how to fight poverty, how to uh, build better institutions. But what this framework implies is that there can't be a one size fits all solution. If you start here and want to enter into the corridor, what you have to do is strengthen society. If you start here and want to enter into the corridor, path two, you have to strengthen the state because you have very weak state institutions. If you start here, you have to do both at the same time. Very different types of solutions, very different types of coalitions are necessary. But I wanna end in my last two minutes with a very important point. If we are trying to deal with many of these problems. The way to do it is to build better state institutions. And especially as we are dealing with new inequalities, new technologies, we need more redistribution, better social safety nets, better ways of protecting people's rights. But this individual, which was one of the most brilliant economists of his time, gave one warning against this. He, reacted to the beverage report, which came out in 1942 and laid out the foundations of the welfare state in the UK, 
by writing a memo and an essay and then this book, which is probably the most influential social science book of the 20th century. He said that if you make the state very strong, you're going to build a new totalitarianism, a new road to serfdom. In terms of the preface for the American edition, Hayek says this means, among other things, that even a strong tradition of political liberty is no safeguard if the danger is precisely that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy that spirit. So if you look at it from the perspective of our framework, actually Hayek was onto something. So here is the way to interpret Hayek. Take a society like Britain that's in the corridor, not here has a lot of problems, lots of hierarchies, lots of inequalities up to <coughs> leading up to uh, World War II. Still a traditional class-based society, but still some degree of balance between state and society. And then Hayek says, well, you now come and bring administrative control, much stronger state institutions. You're going to take Britain out of the corridor. And once you do that, you're gonna get this despotic Leviathan dynamics. Was Hayek right? It turns out he was completely wrong. Even though he understood this balance point, what he did not factor in was the Red Queen effect. So what happened before actually Hayek was writing already in Sweden and Norway, then in the UK and Europe, and then finally in the US and Japan, is that as state institutions got stronger in terms of redistribution capacity, in terms of uh, interference in the economy, in all, many cases, useful interference in the economy, but still Hayek's concerns would apply. As that happened, society also got stronger. And it got stronger by organizing better, deepening democracy, free media, civil society organizations flourishing, and people having voice and monitoring ability over elites and citizens. Unfortunately, that process stopped in some ways after the 1980s with new technologies and new political balances favoring big businesses, capital owners, and elites. So we are moving away from the corridor in some sense. But this picture still is relevant. And what it says is that when we're dealing with new emergencies, such as COVID-19 and the needs for greater redistribution in the face of automation, inequality, and globalization, what we should not shy away from is the state shouldering new responsibilities. But what we should always keep in mind is that we need this balance of power between state and society and between different segments of society. And that, I think, is the secret sauce of building better institutions for the 21st century. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now, and I look forward to your questions and comments.